we are varied culture different uh, uh, industries different uh, uh, societies we have so uh, the demands the requirements of the society and stakeholders are also different so education is a complete uh, it, it must give it must be open ended it must promote and give the opportunity to the students to uh, to pursue as per their desires there are millions of courses and millions of topics there and with a few clerical people sitting in your uh, at delhi office uh, will you be able to recognize and evaluate the credits and the equivalence and recognitions of credits it is very tough it is impossible so far we are paying the fees per semester or per year but now after abc it is going to be per course every course will be charged don't you think that it is going to commercialize it the hidden agenda is the government of india is planning to make a city centric and uh, they want to create a citizens of their choice that is the intent of the basic intent of this uh, framework hello welcome to news click the central government recently released a document on the national higher education qualification framework what is this framework what does it hold when it's implemented how will it be for the next generation of students to speak about this we have with us educationist jawahar nesan who has been a vice chancellor of many universities hello sir thanks a lot for joining us sir can you tell us uh, why was a new framework uh, uh, drafted and how did it go about the drafting process actually the uh, the draft framework itself says that it aims to uh, 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 to facilitate the recognition of different types of qualifications we have in different academic settings in uh, in the country because there are uh, many states having their own uh, pattern of education system and uh, different universities are trying to uh, offer different qualifications like ba Uh, masters and postgraduate studies and doctoral studies in different formats so they say that if we standardize the system uh, and centralize it it would be possible easy for the uh, stakeholders like the industry people employers and even the higher education institutions where students are seeking uh, enrollments in ad- admissions in higher education so that they can use these qualifications uh, 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 across the country because it is going to follow one pattern uh, so uh, that is the purpose but most of the countries who have implemented a standard uh, nation wide common framework have also claimed so there is no deviation in the objectives of the uh, this thing but the main thing is you have to make it so generic so that it can be applied uh, in uh, in a, in a diverse academic uh, uh, rec- uh, settings where the educational requirements are uh, different where the demands of the industries and and the, and the the necessary skills required by the industry and the society are very much different because it is contextual in nature that it has to reflect the regions always higher education or even school education is like this so you cannot standardize the skills the standardize the uh, the knowledge supposed to be attained by the learners so if you do so you are standardizing and it is going to uh, make a uniform uh, kind of uh, skills and uh, knowledge across the country so the educational institutions will not be able to Uh, uh innovate their uh, deliveries educational delivery process they cannot innovate their curriculum and they cannot uh, connect the curriculum to the society in different parts of the country because we are varied culture different uh, uh, industries different uh, uh, societies we have so uh, the demands the requirements of the society and stakeholders are also different so you cannot standardize that is one point the other point is that they want to vocationalize the uh, qualifications whether it is ba be mbbs or uh, post graduate studies or even phd's they say that they want to vocationalize it vocationalization in that sense is the country needs laborers skillful laborers 
and we are in uh, deficiency. We have scarcity of uh, technical, technically skillful workforce in the country. So that means that they want to create more laborers and skillful laborers. That is fine. I don't mind about it. We, any country, uh, uh, you know, should have the ability to promote the or create the human potentials to satisfy the uh, requirements. But it should be optional, you know. You cannot thrust upon anybody through your standardized system. And it is going to, and also, you see, for instance, they have created different exit and entry points in the course of studies, whether it is first degree, master's or PhD. You can exit anytime or you can enter back anytime. But the conditions that they have laid out is that uh, once you fail or you, you, you fail to uh, pass through the uh, examinations and things and you will be laid out and you have to exit and you have to prepare and reappear and clear the examinations to come back and uh, uh, go through, pursue the studies. So the earlier kind of systems are gone now in this framework. So that means most of the students will be discouraged from continuing their studies. So eventually what will happen? Dropouts will be increasing. And uh, the vocationalization is coming here during the exit point. Every time a student exits, at that time they give 10 credit worth of uh, coaching on some skills. And that skill is what sort of skills are you going to give? No, it's, do you have uh, uh, the infrastructure and human potential to coach millions and millions of students who are going to exit at every uh, uh, milestones in their studies. Do you have the workforce? And are you going to, uh, uh, to impart the 21st century skills which are highly demanding? Or are you going to give operational uh, level skills? Are you going to promote operatives? Or the 21st century skills necessary for the production and means of production that is uh, going to be driving the economy in the 21st century. Cannot, because you don't have the human resource and you don't have the equipments and infrastructure to import such skills and that should be integral, a part, an integral part of education. It cannot be an additional or an add-on uh, kind of uh, skills and knowledge. Why don't you build such skills and knowledge in the curriculum itself and offer them instead of giving them 10 credit two months training, is it enough to get skilled to go and work as a workforce, a technical workforce? So this is completely a, a decent based uh, educational system. In Tamil, we call it as a vocation, the kal, kula kalbi. That means that it is traditionally, the students are going to follow the traditional jobs, family jobs, and they cannot mobilize between jobs, between occupations from lower end to the higher end. So those who are at the, the bottom most you know, layers of the society, who are, uh, whose occupations are traditional and family oriented and descent based, and they will be encouraged to go back and do the same uh, descent based uh, jobs and occupations. They cannot get intergenerational occupational mobility uh, uh, and uh, get their due stakes in the emerging opportunities in job and uh, occupations and uh, economic activities. So education is a complete, uh, it, it must give, it must be open-ended. It must promote and give the opportunity to the students to, uh, to pursue as per their desires. But it is discouraging the students. And also, you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the fundamental centrality of this system is ABC, Academic Bank of Credit. If you look at that, the credits are managed, maintained, implemented, recognized, uh, authorized by the university. Universities have their own statutory bodies like academic council and the syndicates or senates. And they are the constitutional bodies. Like the parliament of India, you know, legislating for the country, the syndicate and the academic council is the, like a parliament. And they are empowered to recognize, to identify, to accredit, and to authorize the credits. Who you are sitting in Delhi to recognize. There are millions of courses and millions of topics there. And with a few clerical people sitting in your, uh, at Delhi office, uh, will you be able to recognize and evaluate the credits and equivalents and recognitions of credits? It is very tough. It is impossible. 
what they are trying to do is to promote the digital uh, online uh, educational system and uh, because the ABC cannot be practically uh, conducted offline in the classrooms because students pursuing here can take for instance uh, courses in uh, Banaras in the university in that case can he go and study there cannot it is only possible online that means why do you promote online because the world trade organization is promoting you know such online educational uh, services because education is, is, is a trade under God's agreement and uh, you can get services from across the sea also and across uh, the country who are dominant uh, in the education sector, dominant in the sense that market dominance, not a academic excellence. And uh, these private sector uh, people having the market muscles, they will penetrate into the system and commercialize. So, so far we are paying the fees per semester or per year. But now after ABC, it is going to be per course. Every course will be charged. Don't you think that it is going to commercialize it? It is. So there will be no reservation. And are you going to give any reservation to disadvantaged students to take courses in IIT Chennai or IIT Delhi? And who will be able to access those uh, credits, the courses in such top institutions in the country? Is it possible for a, uh, for a person sitting in village who doesn't know any idea how to what to take and where to contact and how to take who does who is not having any access to an internet connectivities and things do you expect them to take courses across the uh, country in different top institutions it is not possible so in all respect this is finally i would like to say the hidden agenda is the government of india is planning to make a city centric this is the final point i would like to comment on it they want to create citizens of their choice per their desire and they are in collusion with the, the super special communities, specially cultivated communities and the market forces. So this triangulated coalition is uh, trying to create a city centre in this country and this city centre is that uh, should follow the kind of a nationalism that this right wing government ruling this country. So it is a jingoist nationalistic and a fascist nationalistic framework and uh, they want to create a citizens of their choice that is the intent of the basic intent of this uh, framework so who was involved in the drafting uh, process who are the stakeholders who have created this uh, 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 framework and where have they taken their uh, inputs from actually they have uh, involved a few academics uh, academicians and some uh, bureaucrats are also involved in the committee and uh, per the direction of uh, the UGC uh, they have uh, uh, started formulating this but without any consultations with any of the academic uh, stakeholders, education stakeholders. For instance, you compare uh, this, the development of this framework with the European framework. The European Union has been working for 20 years to develop a framework, still it is off baked Whereas these guys have just sat for six months and they, they created uh, one framework with few guys and without any uh, uh, taking inputs from the stakeholders, from institutions, from teachers, from uh, students, from other uh, employers and industries, without taking input, they have just decided themselves. And finally, one fine day, they gave two weeks and three weeks time for public consultations, not giving enough time for us to even respond. And then they closed the door. Is this the way uh, uh, a common framework uh, should be created? It is not. You look at even Australia or England or even the European Union uh, who have common framework. They have established this uh, for uh, uh, several years, engaging all stakeholders. Even now today, the social dimension of European common uh, framework, higher education framework, is yet to be uh, arrived. They say that we are not able to even uh, think how the social dimensions like the social impediments disadvantages could be resolved through the common framework they are after 20 years that is the experience in a diverse very much uh, uh, casteist kind of structure we have in this country most of the i think that more than 90 percent of the uh, students uh, would be affected by this 
what does this framework say about value based education the value based education is the is the fundamental uh, theme behind the uh, framework they have stated general skills technical skills educational skills and many things but the main theme underlies is the value based education where they want the learner to be an obedient citizen and they say that you must listen constitution you must be obedient you must learn all the ethics the values and uh, the values they also have quoted non violence peace see there are so much values say if i want to be a, a violent person and if my constitution allows me why do you want me uh, to emphasize non violence then why do you quote is it the only value you have and why what do you uh, what is your uh, stand on that that um, uh, the ethics and values you are going to prop- propagate your uh, kind of value system uh perpetrated by the minority uh, super class communities uh, and it will be inflicted upon the majority communities and their value systems are whose value anyway are you going to teach you go across any part of the world even malaysia they also have some common framework these are all under developed countries where they never talk about value because if you talk about value different communities different cultures have different value system you cannot commonalize the value system that's why you should be very much careful to be open enough to be so generic enough so that they can accommodate their values respectively who you are sitting in delhi talking about uh, you know em- emphasizing your values deciding defining your values whose value is it so it is that is why i said that they are trying to uh you know implement their ideals mm-hmm. you know to be blunt i would say it is the hindutva ideals of this current government and that is the value that they want to incorporate into uh, in in the curriculum and they want to create the citizens of this country to be hindutva citizens that is the ultimate goal of value based education in this country. so is that what triggered you to write a book on it within a matter of 10 days a symbol of totalitarian nationalism Of what course. triggered you here yes. of course i feel that as a citizen of this country and as a as a responsible academician it is my duty to enlighten my colleagues and my fellow citizens on this let them decide i'm not lying i'm not a politician i don't go for votes say the thing is every not only me every fundamentally every citizen has a responsibility to reflect upon it because it is deciding their fate and it is not my my concern is this should not be seen as an educational framework it is a social framework they want to create a, a, a kind of a society they they desire and they the only way you can penetrate and create and transform that society is education and they take this as the framework as advantage and as a tool to uh, to achieve their goals and that is the ultimate uh, thing so that means every citizen should look this framework not purely as an educational framework but it is a part and parcel of their society their fi- livelihood and their evolution so it's every citizen's job to reflect upon it and uh, take a call on it whether it is right or wrong thank you sir thank you for giving us a brief on what the higher education framework is detailing uh thanks a lot thanks for watching and we have more videos coming up on the topic please keep a watch